Tonight we begin a new quarter of study, and as we do, it's good to see everyone. Uh, if you're visiting with us, we're grateful for your presence. We're glad that you're here. Uh, all of us need to be reminded that Sunday, our Bible classes start at 9 o'clock. Worship will follow that at 10, and of course then at 5 in the afternoon. So let's all purpose to be here for that. Now, what we're going to be looking at through this quarter of study, we're looking at running with horses, learning to deal with life's problems. And so this is what we're going to be introducing tonight. We're going to be talking about specifically this title, and we're going to be looking at this title from finish to start. You know, sometimes we talk about from start to finish. Well, we're doing it backwards tonight, okay? Instead of from left to right, we're going from right to left. So, uh, you know, hang with me because when we think about this, running with horses, learning to deal with life's problems, this is a very important series of study for all of us. And so we're going to be dealing with problems. Jeff, in Psalm 37, as he read that, as he expounded upon it, uh, that's what the righteous have to deal with. That's what they face. They face many a problem because many times of the wicked. And so let's do this. Uh, look at life's problems. Now we're going to be coming back. I just want to make a statement of each one of these thoughts in our title. And then we'll come back to each one of these. But when you talk about life's problems, here's what I want us to do. I want to challenge us. Because I want us to come up with a list, not tonight. If you have something, please write it down, give it to me tonight. But I want us to come up with a list wherein we can look at these various things in life that cause us, that give us problems. And so be thinking about that. What would be considered in your life life's problems? Or maybe there's someone that you know and they're experiencing hard times right now. What is it that they're going through? What is that life problem? And so think about that, life's problems, and then learning to deal with. We're not going to get together and just throw up some life's problems and, and talk about them and define them, but we want to learn how to deal with them. And so that emphasis there, learning, learning to deal with life's problems, so very important. Life's problems are not going to stop. Life's problems are not going to somehow just, just vanish. And so we have to do this. It's not enough to be able to define life's problems, to be able to point them out, but what are we going to do about them? Again, you remember Romans 4 in verse 3, what saith the Scripture? Of course, that Scripture is talking about Abraham. But when we turn our attention to life's problems, what does the Bible have to say about these things? What does God reveal in His Word about these things? And then, of course, that phrase, running with horses. Now, we're going to define exactly what this means and what it is later on. But right now, let me just emphasize this. This right here is God's solution. This right here is God's answer. If you want to learn what to do with life's problems, if you want to learn how to deal with them, how to cope with them, how to solve them, here's the answer right here. We have to learn how to run with horses. This is what God is telling us. And so, once again, life's problems are not going to fade away. They're not just going to ride away in the sunset. Sometimes we wish they would. But sometimes life's problems intensify. They get worse. And so what are we going to do? How are we going to learn how to deal with them? Well, we're going to learn how to run with horses. Let's not make the problems bigger than they are. That's sometimes what we do. 
We just focus on the problem, that's all. What about the solution? And so we have to look at the problem, but look through the problem. If you'll remember, in Psalm 46 and verse 1, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. God identifies himself as a help in time of trouble. We're dealing with these problems, with these troubles, and God says, here I am. I'm your help. And not only that, but in Psalm 119 and verse 175, let my soul live that it might praise you and let your judgments help me. So God says, I am a help. God says, my word, my judgments are a help. We have help and we need to take advantage of that help. Likewise, we have brothers and sisters in Christ who will help. So really, we're without excuse when we just say, woe is me, and here are these problems, and they're so big, and they seem to be getting bigger. Well, then let's learn how to deal with them. Let's do what God tells us to do in dealing with these problems. And so let's go back to this because we want to mention some more things concerning these, but life's problems, look at this. Look at this first one. Life does have problems. You think about Job 14 and verse 1. Man who is born of woman is short-lived and full of trouble. Well, at times I'm sure we all feel like that. You know, life is short and that brevity of life is just occupied with problem after problem. We get through with this problem. Here's another trouble. Here are these trials that come on, you know, upon us. Here, here's sorrow, here's heartache. Well, life does have problems. Uh, you remember John 16 and verse 33, in the world you will have tribulation. Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So Jesus acknowledges that. And you look at so much of the writing in both the Old and New Testament and God's prophets, what did they experience? They experienced trouble. They had problems. And the righteous in the New Testament, there were problems. In fact, in 1 Peter 4 and verse 12, concerning the suffering that Peter writes about that was coming upon them, he says, don't count it as some strange thing. This isn't strange for the Christian. Remember 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12, all who, did, who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And so here's the problem, here's the persecution, here are the troubles, here's the sorrow, in 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 3, Paul says, we are destined for this. This is reality. This is normal. And again, life does have problems. Yes, sometimes those problems are overwhelming. Yes, those problems are disheartening. Yes, those problems bring sorrow and heartache into our life. But again, they're there. And so we have to learn, we have to learn what to do with those problems. Now, notice this next point. God will not take problems out of this life. God never promises that. You know, sometimes I think we're very, very naive because problems happen in our lives and first thing we want to do is ask God why. Why am I going through this? And then after asking him why, then why aren't you hearing me? And why aren't you doing something about it? And why aren't you answering my prayer? And, and why, why, why? Well, God never promised to take the problems out of this life. Remember, we've already mentioned John 16 and verse 33. But Jesus was the one that said, in the world you will have tribulation. He did not say, don't worry about this, be of good cheer because God's going to take all the problems out of this world. That's not what he said. He said, in the world you will have tribulation, but then he follows it by saying, be of good cheer. What? <laughs> you want me to be of cheer because I have problems in this world? No, that's not what he meant either. But in the world you will have tribulation. Be of good cheer. Here's why we can have good cheer. Here's why we can still rejoice. 
I have overcome the world. Jesus says, yes, I faced those problems. We overcame those problems. You remember in Revelation 2 and verse 9, Jesus speaking to the church there, the church at Smyrna. He says, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. Now, when he says, I know your tribulation, he knew their tribulation, one reason, because he'd already experienced it. He'd already lived this life, and he was to be made in his, in, as his brethren in the likeness of all things. Remember Hebrews, the second chapter? And also this same truth is echoed again in Hebrews, the fourth chapter. He experienced these problems. And so life does have problems. God will not take problems out of this life. And think about this. God will not take us out of the realm of problems. Do you remember what Jesus said in John 17 and verse 15? He says, I do not pray that you take them out of this world, but you keep them from the evil one. Notice that. Jesus said, I'm not asking for you to take them out of the world. And so God's not going to take the problems out of the world, and he's not going to take us out of this world of problems, but he is our help. I haven't asked you to take them out of this world, but to keep them from the evil one. So there he is. He, he's our help in keeping us. And remember, as he keeps us, we keep ourselves. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Jude verse 21. So God keeps and we keep. And we, in that regard, we're, we're fellow workers with him. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 1. And so, again, you think about life's problems. Yes, life does have problems. And God's not going to take the problems out of this life. Nor is God going to take us out of this life full of problems. Well, that leaves one thing for us to do. And that is to learn. To learn how to deal with these problems. It's not easy. It's, it's hard in some ways. But it can be done, and moreover, it must be done if we're going to live faithful to Him. Now, look at this. Learning to deal with. We're talking about learning to deal with them, learning to deal with problems. And we emphasize that learning. I want us to focus upon that for a moment tonight. Because this, this is the key right here. Problems? Yes. Let's learn Let's go to the feet of our God as a pupil, as a student, and ask him to teach us. You remember in Luke, the 11th chapter, verses 1 and 2? You remember the disciples came upon Jesus, he was praying, and out of reverence for both him and his practice of prayer, they waited until he ceased. And then they said, Lord, teach us. Teach us to pray, even as John taught his disciples. But that, that phrase, that request, Lord, teach us. Oh, that ought to be our, our attitude. Lord, you know the problems of life. You've already experienced them. You know that problems are bigger at times than we are. They are stronger than us. But Lord, teach us. Who else do we want to be taught by? This is the only one, Jesus, our Savior, who faced every temptation, who dealt with every problem, and did so without sin. That's the one I want teaching me. Lord, teach us. Help us to learn. To learn to deal with these problems. Now, look what we're going to do here. Here's a verse and I want to ask a question based upon this verse. It's in Psalm 119, at the beginning of that psalm. Remember, that psalm is the longest psalm or quote-unquote chapter in the Bible. 176 verses. So here we are near the beginning. And the psalmist says, I will praise you with uprightness of heart when I learn your righteous judgments. So I want you to look at this, this adverb of time. 
When is the psalmist going to praise God with uprightness of heart? That's only going to take place. It's only going to happen when he learns his righteous judgments. Implied in this verse is if he doesn't learn God's righteous judgments, he will be in no position to praise him with uprightness of heart. There's something that has to happen before he can do that. And so I will praise you with uprightness of heart. When, when will that be? When I learn your righteous judgments. Now, here's the question. When and how do we learn God's righteous judgments? When do we learn his righteous judgments? We're going to look at some verses and I want you to hear these verses because this, this is very simple, okay? This is learning 101. Uh, you, you can't get more basic than this. But sometimes we, we look for that one thing that's going to help me learn. And it must be something very secret because this is difficult, it's hard. And so we look for that, that powerful truth, we think. That's going to push us over the hump, going to help us learn. Now, we better go back to basics. We better understand that what we're asking here about learning is really quite simple. And so, notice these verses right here. I want you to take your Bibles, and I want us to see a pattern emerge in these verses right here. Deuteronomy 4, we're just going to read verses 9 and 10. Look what this says, Deuteronomy 4. I'm going to start reading in verse 9. We'll go through verse 10. I'm reading from the New King James Version. But look what it says. Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the thing your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life, and teach them to your children and your grandchildren. Now look at verse 10 especially concerning the day that you stood before the Lord your God in Horeb, when the Lord said to me, Gather the people to me, and I will let them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days, of, all the days that they live on the earth, and they might teach their children. Now, look what it says here. You gather the people together, What's that purpose? Well, notice this. It says, I will let them hear my words. They're going to hear God's words. And then it says, it says they, uh, that they may learn to fear me. Uh, how do we learn to fear God? Well, we do so as and when we hear his word. And so we hear and then we learn those, those verbs in this verse here. And so we have to hear. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of the Lord, Romans 10 and verse 17. And not only does faith come by hearing, but learning. Learning comes by hearing. If you've got someone and they won't listen, whether it is a child, whether it is an employee, whether it is a friend, whether it is a, you know, coaches in the audience, whether it's a, a player, if they're not going to hear, let me tell you something, they're not going to learn. And so you hear. And by virtue of that, you learn. You hear my words, you learn the fear of the Lord. Keep that in mind, the hearing, the learning. Go with me to chapter 17 of Deuteronomy. I like this context because this is talking about the king, the king of Israel. This is before they have a king. But God says, here's what I want to happen when you get a king. Here's what I want the king to do. And so this is going to apply to anyone, to everyone. 
What is the equation? You hear and you learn. Hearing equals learning if we hear and listen like we should. But read this with me now. Uh, we're going to read verses 14 through 20. Look what it says. When you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, and possess it and dwell in it, and say, I will set a king over me like the nations that are around me, you shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses, one from among your own brethren you shall set as king over you. You sh uh, may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Now listen to this. Talking about the king. But he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself lest his heart turn away. Nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. Also it shall be, when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book. Uh, it says, From one before the priests, the Levites, and it says, And it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, and he may be uh, careful to observe all the words of this law and the statutes, that his heart may not be lifted above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right nor to the left, and that he may prolong his days in the kingdom, and that his children in the midst of Israel. Now remember, in Deuteronomy 4, it was hear and learn. Well, here it says, read and learn. Even the king, he's not exempt from this. When you have a king, he needs to make a copy of the law. And he needs to read that law. Why should the king read it? So that he can learn. Notice it's the same thing. Uh, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God. So we hear and learn. We read and learn. This is what we're talking about, how to overcome, how to deal with life's problems. Well, we have to hear and we have to read in that hearing and that reading from God's Word. That's how we're going to learn. Now, look at Deuteronomy 31. In Deuteronomy 31, we're just going to read verses 12 and 13, but the same thing. Over and over in Deuteronomy, God is going to say, you need to hear my word so that you can learn to fear me. And so you can't separate the hearing from the learning. You can't separate the reading from the learning. If we do not hear, we will not learn. If we were not going to read, we're not going to learn. And so look at this, Deuteronomy 31, verses 12 and 13. Look what it says here. Let me get to 31. In verse 12, Gather the people together, men and women and little ones, and the stranger who is within your gate, that they may hear, notice that, that they may hear and that they may learn to fear the Lord your God and carefully observe all the words of this law, and that their children who have not known it may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land which you cross the Jordan to possess. Well, there it is two times in those verses. Hear and learn. Hear and learn. Learning to deal with life's problems. How do we learn to do that? We hear God's Word. We read God's Word. And we pay attention to it. We, we heed it. We live accordingly. Um, look at Proverbs 1 and verse 5. This is interesting. Now keep, keep in mind what we've been showing from Deuteronomy. This process of hearing and, and learning. Look, look what Proverbs, look how it begins. Remember, this is the quest for wisdom. Let me get to Proverbs, the first chapter. Proverbs 1 and verse 5, it says, A wise man, emphasize that, a wise man 
Notice, will hear and increase learning. And a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. But if we're wise, if we're wise, we're going to hear. And thus we're going to learn, as it says here, the wise man will increase learning. The wise man hears, the wise man increases learning. Look at this, the same truth in Proverbs 9 in verse 9. Look what it says here. It says, give instruction to a wise man and he will be still wiser. Teach a just man and he will increase in learning. And so as we hear, as we read, as we are taught, teach a wise man or a just man and he will increase in learning. Well, this is how we learn. It's through this process. There's nothing mystical, magical about this. You know, sometimes we act like, well, how did that person learn how to do that? Well, they listened to people and they read. Even if you take it out of the spiritual realm and just put that principle in the secular realm, that's how it works there too. How do we learn? We listen, we hear, we read, we are taught. And thus now we have learned something. But in the spiritual realm, that is a must, okay? So hear and learn. Now look at this. We won't turn to all of these, but in Matthew 17 and verse 5, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. This is God speaking about His Son, but notice what He wants us to do. He wants us to hear Him. You remember in Matthew 11 and verse 29, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your soul. But notice that. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. We're taught to hear Him, we're taught to learn of him, some translations say, and from him, the new King James. So it's the same principle. We hear and learn. That's what we do. Ephesians 4 and verse 20. In verse 17 of Ephesians 4, Paul talks about do not, do not walk like the other Gentiles. That's how verse 17 begins. And then as he goes through 17 and 18 and 19, he just sort of tells how they walk, how they live. But he concludes in verse 20 by saying, you have not so learned Jesus. You didn't learn Jesus like this. You didn't pattern your life after the Lord. You didn't learn him living like this. And so, but again, hear him, learn from him. And when we don't, we haven't learned Christ like this. Now, go back with me. I know we're going to get caught here. But go back with me to Deuteronomy. I want you to see this. Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 18 and verse 9. Notice this because we're going to learn from somebody. Somehow we're going to learn whether it is from the right source or from the wrong source. Whether we learn from the Lord, learn of me, or whether we learn from the world. And I think sometimes, I think we'll all have to agree that sometimes we, we get too close to the world. And sometimes it's almost as if we're willing to sell out God and His Word because we say, well, He hasn't, he hasn't listened to me, He doesn't hear me, and these problems are not leaving. Remember what we said? Sometimes the problems are not going to leave. Sometimes the problems are going to intensify. We need to understand that. But even in light of that, we can still learn how to deal with these problems. Look at Deuteronomy 18 and verse 9. Look what it says here. Uh, when you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. Israel, God's bringing you into this land flowing with milk and honey. Who are you going to learn from? You're going to learn from your God. You're going to learn His ways. Or are you going to learn the abominations of the nations? Well, you know, far too many times 
That's what they were learning. They were learning the abominations that their neighbors were committing. Look at Proverbs 22. In Proverbs 22, look at this practical application of this, of this very truth. Look what Solomon says. Proverbs 22, verses 24 and 25. Read this with me. It says, do, no, verse 24 and 25. Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man do not go. Now here's the reason. Here's why there's no friendship with an angry man. Here's why you do not follow the furious man. Why is that, Lord? Lest you learn his ways and set a snare for your soul. You learn their ways, you're going to set a snare for your own soul. So we don't learn from the world. You don't go to the world to find out, how do I deal with life's problems? The world is not going to tell you anything of value. You don't learn from them. We learn from God. We learn from His Word. Look at this next one, Jeremiah, the 10th chapter. Jeremiah 10. We're only going to read verse 2. But if you want a good read tonight, read Jeremiah 10. And here's the contrast that's going to be set forth. It's going to be that God of wood, the idols, the gods of wood, as opposed to the God of wonder the only true and living God. And there are many contrasts that are going to be made in Jeremiah, the 10th chapter. But it all begins, it all begins with this. Look at Jeremiah 10 and verse 2. This is our last verse. Thus says the Lord, do not learn the way of the Gentiles. Do not be dismayed at the sign of heaven, for the Gentiles are dismayed at them. Talking about astrology there. Don't, don't get upset with the signs of the heaven. Now, astronomy is a legitimate science. But astrology is what he's talking about here. When the world lets the moon and the stars and their placement dictate how we live our lives. If you like to read the horoscope, you better get a better read than that. Okay? Because the stars have no impact upon your life whatsoever. They can't help you. They can't harm you. And so, no, we don't go to that to find out, what am I going to do today? You know, when on Tuesday, when I go to Brown Trail, I go to McDonald's early. And usually I'll pick up this little neighborhood thing. They always have, they always have the horoscope in there. And, and typically I don't read it at all, but if I want a laugh... And that's all it's good for. If you want to laugh, read what it says. It's so vague, it's so ambiguous that you might, you know, this, this might be a good time to do this or do that. And, but some people, sad to say, they live their lives by that. They don't do anything until they read their horoscope. That's exactly what God is saying through Jeremiah. Do not learn the way of the nations. Don't be afraid of these things with astrology. Who are we going to learn from? That's the question we want to end with. Now, we'll pick it up next Wednesday night, Lord willing, right here at Jeremiah 10. Life's problems, learning to deal with them. And then we're going to see what God is talking about when he says running with horses. What's he telling us to do? What's he telling Jeremiah to do in the context? And then by application, how? How do we learn, likewise, how to deal with these problems? Appreciate your presence very, very much. Let's be thinking about this as we prepare for next week's study. Hey, my brother. I think I am. I like it.